and welcome to Studio RC, a weekly encouragement for your recovery and your faith. My name is Pastor Max and I am an alcoholic and I'm sober today only by the grace of God and the fellowship of the program as contained in the recovery literature. I'm also a follower of Jesus. Today we're going to conclude our, uh, our series on prayer. We've been doing a lot of prayers leading up to this particular episode, and some of the prayers have been found directly in recovery literature. Some have been found directly in the Bible. All are encouraging and meant to encourage us in our recovery and help those in early recovery, those who have established recovery, those searching for faith um, and trying to define their higher power. All of the prayers that have led up to this moment have done that. Today we're going to do a little, something a little different. Um, we're going to look at something that I think is it's really impactful. Um, and I, I don't know if it's considered a prayer per se, um, but we're going to look at the last seven words or the last seven utterances from Jesus on the cross. As this, when this airs, it will air during the middle of Lent, and it's going to be in our time of, for people of faith, a preparation time for Easter. And I thought that this was not only a perfect, but a powerful example. When Jesus is on the cross, and he's gone through all that he has experienced on Good Friday from the Monday, Thursday, where he experiences the Last Supper, he, um, he is uh, denied, he is uh, all the things that lead up to it. Um, he has gone through incredible physical, emotional, um, just struggles and pain and challenges. And he's on the cross and he says seven different things. And so I want to look at this and just be encouraged uh, by what Jesus says. This is going to be predominantly, this is probably going to weigh a little on the, the faith side of our recovery church, a little bit more on the church side today, but these words are powerful and will encourage you. And it, there's uh, really something to be learned. During uh, the hours that Jesus spent nailed on the cross, he spoke seven different times. And these memorable utterances from the cross have come to be known as the seven words or the seven uh, utterances uh, because it's the last things he said. In seven brief expressions, utterances, while he is an unbelievable amount of pain, while he is in the process of dying and uh, suffocating to death, because that's how you die from crucifixion, Jesus proclaimed this beautiful synopsis of the gospel, of the good news. The pastoral heart of Jesus can be seen on the cross. And hopefully we, as a people of faith and people who are followers, can, ex can experience and can be ministered by those words. He shows why he is the good shepherd. He shows why he is the prince of peace. And he did this all while shepherding his sheep in these final seven words. And so what I want to do is I want to go over them uh, just to give you an overview. And then we will uh, go and we'll take a look at each and every one of them uh, and, and see what it's saying to us. So the first time, and I'm going to go in chronological order, um, Jesus speaks to the Father, and this is in Luke 23, 34. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Uh, the second time Jesus speaks to the criminal on the cross, um, again in Luke 23, he says, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. Then Jesus speaks to Mary and John. And this comes from the Gospel of John 19. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. The fourth utterance is, Jesus cries out to the Father. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachatani. Woo, that's a mouthful. Um, 
but it translates to that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's from Matthew. Mark has a similar recollection in Mark 15. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabat, sabachatani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Forsaken and abandoned. It's the slight variation also in regards to the version. The fifth utterance is, uh, Jesus is thirsty. And in John, Jesus knew that everything was now finished. And to f fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirsty. Um, in the sixth utterance, he says in John, the Gospel of John, it is finished. And then Jesus' last words coming from Luke, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. So this, this paints this picture, this journey that Jesus goes on while on the cross. And um, I want to take a look at each one. And one of them I'm going to focus on just a little bit more because uh, it's one of the ones that spoke most to me and the one maybe I even struggled with a little bit. But we'll start out with Luke 23, 24. Jesus speaks to the Father to the Father. He says, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And this is an often quoted verse, but in his, in his ministry, Jesus had proven he had the power to forgive sins. He had taught his disciples to forgive both enemies and friends alike. In the midst of his excruciating suffering, the heart of Jesus focused on others rather than himself. Here we see the nature of his true love, unconditional and divine. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. What powerful words. He goes to the Father and says, forgive them, which means everything in our, our fourth step list and the things we share in the fifth step. Everything in our eighth step list uh, inventory list that we make of amends we have to make. And then the ninth step where we go to make those amends, Jesus says on, on our behalf, forgive them. For they know not what they are doing, what they, they do, what they did. Those, those sins, those things that turn, turn our, ourselves away from God, that separates us from God. We don't know what we're doing. And so Jesus pleads on our behalf and, uh, he speaks to the Father on our behalf, even in his moment of greatest anguish, moments before he is to die. He th he's thinking of others and our forgiveness. He never loses sight of his purpose and his purpose to, to uh, fulfill God's mandate to come and be that sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God to cover all of our sins. He never forgets that. In the second utterance, Jesus speaks to the criminal on the cross. And again, this is such a powerful moment. In Luke 23, 43, it says, I tell you the truth, today you'll be with me in paradise. And if, if you remember the scene, Jesus is flanked on each side by criminals. One criminal makes fun of him and is teasing him. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you're a savior, why don't you come down off the cross and take us off the cross? And, and just is, is just being uh, just basically nasty to Jesus um, and antagonizing him. And, but the other criminal recognizes both criminals that are on each side of Jesus have done something that by the law, they are to be punished to the point of crucifixion. But one of the, the criminals recognized that Jesus really had not done anything wrong. And he recognized his divinity. And he said, well, will you remember me today? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Why will you be with me? Because I know today you're going to die. You're going to die alongside of me. And you know what? I'll take you to where I'm going. That blows the water out of so many, uh, you know, understandings of, you know, don't you have to live a good life to go to heaven? No, it, right at the last moment, this, this criminal who had committed crimes to the point where they were killing him, 
Jesus is saying, no, if, if you recognize my divinity, th then you, you can come with me. Um, the criminal who uh, had recognized who Jesus was, and he expressed faith in him as a savior. The thief would not have long to wait. And as Jesus promised this man that he would share eternal life with Christ in paradise that very day. His faith secured him immediate, an immediate home in God's kingdom. Again, that should uh, encourage us that, that Jesus wants to, in our faith, and, and as shaky as it can be, and as, as imperfect as it can be, that there, there's, there's nothing that in uh, our lives or even in our addiction that we have done that can't be forgiven, that, that first one, and that he, he wants to take us in our belief along with him to, uh, to heaven, um, which, is, which is incredible. The third statement, Jesus speaks to Mary and John. This comes from John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. And I just have to pause. I always give John a hard time because John writes the, the gospel. And then when he refers to himself, he always refers to himself as uh, the disciple whom he loved. Um, I always think that that's I always get a little kick out of that. Now, I know that this is serious, but um, John always makes me smile a little bit. You know, he's like, uh, if you were writing a, a note about, you know, um, your parents and you're writing a story and, you know, their favorite child, you know, the one that he, that they really loved me. Um, but when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, this is what Jesus said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And he's pointing to John, who is not her blood son. And, and, and to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. Jesus, looking down from the cross, was still filled with the concern of a son for the, for the earthly needs of his mother. He's looking down to Mary and says, she needs to be taken care of. And none of his brothers were there to care for her. So he gave the, the, the task to the apostle John. Here we clearly see Christ's humanity. He saw his mother and he said, John, take care of him. This, this is your mother. And, and mom, John is your son. He will take care of you. He's, he's reassuring his mom that like, you, I can't be here, but John will help take care of you. Even as you grieve, John will be here. It's a beautiful picture, again, of humanity and sensitivity of Jesus um, right down he, he, to, his, to the very family structure and mother. Like he has a macro approach about, you know, forgive all of them for, you know, they don't, they know not what they're doing. They, and then, and he's, he's telling us about how we can follow him to eternity. And then he's, he takes this moment and says to John, take care of mom. Do you take care of her for me? I won't be able to do it, but I know that you can. What a powerful moment. The fourth one is Jesus cries out to his father. And in the Matthew version, Matthew 27, 46, it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark 15, 34 says it this way. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, and the spelling is slightly different, Lima Sabantanani, which again still means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And this is, a different, this is the New Living Translation and the Matthew I shared in the New King James Version to give a little bit of a, a difference. But um, in this darkest hour of suffering, Jesus cries out the opening words of Psalm 22. And it, it's apparent the agony Christ felt as he exp expressed this separation from God. Now, I want to take a few extra moments to look at this one. Um, I've always struggled 
with this with this scripture where he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It, it seemed almost out of character of God, of, of Jesus to say this. So as, as we follow uh, Jesus to the foot of the cross and we find ourselves standing in the edges of darkness, this darkness of the crucifixion, and it's, it's so, um, it's so deep when the nature, when even his nature, Jesus' nature cries out in this kind of protest. And it, I, I don't, it never made sense to me. I, I struggled with it. Why would he say God is forsaking him? Uh, that it, it I, I always struggled with that. It is a darkness so deep that the, the, the humanity of Jesus that lived closer to God than anyone else who ever lived, this, this man who loved God more than any person ever loved God, whoever, who has ever lived, that in that moment, his humanity cried out when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me? How do we explain these this words of anguish, this word of desolation from um, the, someone who loved God so intensely? This is the task we have before us when we look at the crucifixion, when we look at the, the, the different things, but specifically this phrase, phrase that he utters. We stand before it. If we want to enrich our understanding of the crucifixion event, we really have to, to understand what's going on here. Now, you may be aware of the fact that these words are the first lines of the 22nd Psalm which if you read all the way through, ends with this, with the affirmation of faith. Um, in recent times, many persons have learned maybe to gloss over these words uh, by just of Jesus by simply saying, um, all he's doing is quoting Psalm 22, and it's, it's reaffirming his faith to God. Okay, whew, all right, we closed, closed that loophole. Um, but on some level, that almost seems too easy of an answer that when Jesus is experiencing this for him to say, why have you forsaken me? Jesus might have quoted a, a scripture verse, but why this one? Why these words of just, just utter aloneness that he, sh he shares from the beginning of the Psalm? Why not words of affirmation at the end of the Psalm? Uh, the answer is that I really think this is what Jesus is feeling at that moment. It's important for us to realize that as we try to live our lives the way that, that Jesus did through the crucifixion event, that God, God was never closer to Jesus than he was at that moment. Never. He was right there for him. And Jesus still experienced that, that agony that came from, from feeling an apartness from God. At that moment, Satan had come to Jesus, and Jesus had come at length yet again to urge him with his last temptation to tell him that although he's done his part, Jesus, you've done everything, God has forgotten you. That although you lived by the word of God, uh, that, that you spoke the words of God, that although he had refused to be tempted throughout his life. God had left you at this very vulnerable moment to be tempted more than you could bear. That although, Jesus, you have worshipped none other, for that worship, God didn't even care. When the struggle to keep consciously trusting in God began to sink in darkness, when the will of his humanity put forth its last determined effort to, to cry out after the vanish, vanishing vision of the Father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Never had it been so with him before. Jesus had never experienced that before. Never before had he been unable to see God beside him. Yet never was God uh, nearer than that at that moment. Think of the anguish that Jesus well, that, that the Father was experiencing at that moment. 
I, I also did some um, some notes and uh, looked at some things that various theologians th said. And one of the things that Charles Spurgeon said, and I love this, the Savior's outcry is not against God, but to God. I, I love that. Listen to the... As Jesus is saying these words, it's, it's not against God, you forsake me, but to God, God, why have you forsaken me? He's talking to God, my God, my God. He makes a double effort to draw near, he, my God. The grip of appropriateness in the word, my. The reverence of the humility in the word, God. It is my God, my God. Thou art ever God to me. I am a poor creature. You are God. Satan is not going to tempt me. I know that, that you're not turning your back on me per se. And he still, even in the utterance, there is that, that uh, closeness and humility, that reverence, that personalization. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When our heart and our flesh fail. Jesus still, even in those instances for him, he lived by faith. My God, my God. At this moment, the finite soul of the humanity of Jesus came into this awful contact with the in infinite justice of God. The one mediator between God and humankind the, the one that is Jesus, he beheld the holiness of God in arms against the sin of all people whose nature he had espoused. So God, Jesus has this connection with God. He has the greatest connection with God, but at this moment, he's also carrying our sins. He's carrying our sins in such a way that we cannot, that he, he cannot be in full connection with God. The cry is a this deep submission and this strong resolve pleading with God. He knew that the desert, that this desertion was needful. It, it, it was needed in order that he might save the guilty, in order for him to play the role of Lamb of God, being the ultimate sacrifice for each and every person. He's not forsaken needlessly, nor without a worthy design. Think much of all of, of Jesus' suffering, but do not overlook the reason for it. We were the reason for it. Sin is loathed by God, and he who bears it cannot be in happy communion with God. Jesus had all of our sin, all of our fourth step, all of our eighth step. He was carrying it, and he couldn't be in happy communion with God at that moment as he was paying the price for that. The love of the great father to his son, it never ceased. Why then did God forsake the son? Uh, there's no other reason than he stood in our place. He paid the price we could not pay. He paid that for us. God never acts without reason. And since there was no reason in the character or person of the Lord Jesus, why his father should forsake him, we must look elsewhere. Jesus bore the sinner's, the sinner's sin, the sin of each and every one of us. He had to be treated, therefore, as though he were a sinner. Though sinners could be, sinners be, he could never have been, but he took our sin on as his, as, as his own, and his obedience was perfect. So remember, when you come to this particular opportunity or moment at the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's this moment where Jesus has, has not spoken out against God, but he speaks to God on our behalf. I... I just wanted to spend a couple extra moments at that 
that verse because it it had vexed me much of my faith. I, I needed some understanding of this moment because I couldn't simply buy that Jesus just felt, God, you left me. And I wasn't going to, I couldn't buy into, well, he's just quoting the scripture. There was a richer, deeper thing going on there. And there is. And the, the, there are a couple more phrases after this powerful expression. The fifth one is Jesus is thirsty. It tells us in John 19, 28, Jesus knew that everything was now finished. And to fulfill the scriptures, he said, I am thirst, thirsty. Jesus refused the initial drink of vinegar, gall, and myrrh offered to alleviate his suffering. It, it, it would have numbed him. Um, but here, several hours later, we see Jesus fulfilling the Masonic prophecy found in Psalm 69, 21. They offer me sour wine for my thirst. And we come to the sixth utterance in John 19, 30. He says, it is finished. Jesus knew he was suffering the crucifixion for a purpose. These three words were packed with meaning for what was finished here was not only Christ's earthly life, not only his suffering and dying, not only the payment of sin and the redemption of the world, but the very reason and purpose he had come to earth was finished. He had fulfilled his purpose. It is finished. His final act of obedience was complete. The scriptures had been fulfilled. And then Jesus' last words, the seventh utterance from Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Here Jesus closes with the words of Psalm 31, 5, speaking to God the Father. We see complete trust in his heavenly Father. Jesus entered death in the same way he lived each day of his life, offering up his life as the perfect sacrifice and placing himself in God's hands. This journey on the cross, these seven expressions, utterance, these seven words show different pieces of Jesus' character, but boy, what a, what a way to die. He died in some ways on his own terms. He, he didn't control his death. He didn't control how, how people uh, turned on him. But in those moments, he was able to take the, the opportunity to share the gospel of hope and forgiveness and humanity and pain and struggle and acknowledgement of all that God had done in his life. And he did that through these seven expressions. My hope is during this Lenten season, if you're watching this uh, when this first uh, airs, that you will be encouraged by what Jesus said on the cross, not just what he did. What he did on the cross changed our humanity. Everything on the cross that Jesus did changes our lives because of the forgiveness of sin. Had he not resurrected on the third day, the things he did and said on the cross would have been enough. But then we have the resurrection, and that's, that's a whole other topic. But hopefully you're encouraged this day by these topics, by the things that Jesus has said, both to you, about you, and for you. Just know that Jesus loves you so, so very much. And hopefully this is a picture of that. Hopefully you've been encouraged. Hopefully maybe you've learned a new thing or two as well. I just want to say, may God bless you. And I thank you so much for tuning in to Studio RC, another production um, of this platform. We encourage you to like the video, share the video, subscribe, get, get the notifications. Um, 
and really use this to help spread the word of Recovery Church. And we are Recovery Church, and we believe in 12 steps with one goal. May you experience that spiritual awakening, and maybe it's these words that bring you to the point of showing just how incredible Jesus is, and that that will help you in that process of being, as the big book and the Bible both say, reborn. God bless, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.